in that. The adult gastrointestinal tract is it's just a tube that is running from the mouth all the way to the anus. In terms of length, it's nine meters. I asked you a question to say, when you compare the length of the GIT in a live person or a dead person, which one is longer? Is it longer in a live person or it's longer in a dead person? And what are the reasons? Okay, so we didn't get feedback on that one. Just go and check out. But I, I know that anatomy people, lecturers, they mentioned this. So in a cadaver, the JIT is longer as compared to a live person. It's all about the, the muscle tone. So you know to say that when you're alive, there are action potentials that are being transmitted from the brain all the way to the JIT. And you also have the intrinsic nervous supply to the JIT that is active. So when a person is live, there are some kind of action potentials that will bring about partial smooth muscle contraction of the GIT. And that cause some muscles to contract. So the length of the GIT will be shorter in a live person. When you die, there are no action potentials that are being generated or transmitted to the GIT. The muscle tone won't be there. Then the muscles, all the muscles will relax. So when all the muscles of the GIT are relaxing, then the length of the GIT is going to be elongated. So the GIT length is longer in a cadaver as compared to a live person. So the lumen of the tract is continuous with the external environment, which means that its content are technically outside the body. So this lumen of the GIT is continuous with the outside environment. So it means that whatever is contained within the lumen of the GIT is not considered as part of your body, not until you digest and absorb. Otherwise, you can vomit or you can have a diarrhea, then you lose it. So as long as it's within the lumen of the GIT is not considered as part of you, not until you digest and absorb. That's what I mean. So this is just the overview of the digestive system. So the structures that are involved there, we have the gastrointestinal. So the, the structures of the gastrointestinal, we said we have the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, small intestines, and the colon. And we also have accessory organs, which I already mentioned to say we have the teeth, the tongue, the gallbladder, the saliva glands, the liver, and the pancreas. So all these, they have their own function. But what is the general function of the GIT? It takes in food stuff, then it breaks it down. So the, break, uh, the breaking down of this food stuff into monomers that can be absorbed. So now these monomers will be absorbed and it will also get rid of waste products that are coming from digestion. So anything that hasn't been digested, it has to be excreted from the body in form of fecal material. So this is a major function of the GIT. It's mainly to break down, which is digestion itself, absorption. Then later on, it will get rid of waste products that are not digested. Okay, so these are the accessory organs. So the oral cavity, you can see the teeth. We also have the tongue and you have the saliva glands that will produce saliva. So all these are accessory organs to the GIT. So because you've covered this in anatomy, I don't have to waste much time here to explain about the hard palate, the soft palate, the ovula and the other structures that are found in the oral cavity. What I'm interested in are just to mention the accessory organs that are involved in GIT function, especially the teeth that will start the physical digestion or physical breakdown of food stuff. Once you introduce food into the oral cavity, you start breaking it down with your teeth. Then you also have salivary glands that will produce saliva. And saliva is very important because that will make this food to be very soft. If it's a very dry food, you know, to say that the saliva will soften the food, then it will also facilitate in the formation of the bolus so that you swallow it, and then it can easily move from the esophagus all the way to the stomach. So we'll come back and mention the functions of these accessory organs later on. Here, I just want you to appreciate the anatomy. So you can see the oral cavity that is connected to the esophagus via the pharynx. So the pharynx is divided into the nasopharynx, we have the oropharynx, 
and there are range of pharynx. So these are different parts of the pharynx. So you know to say that there are two tubes that are running down your, your neck, that are running down on your neck there, you have the trachea in front of the esophagus. So the esophagus is behind the trachea. So the, the trachea is the, the windpipe, is the one that is going to conduct air from the nostrils or from the nose all the way to the lungs. So you have the, the trachea. So when you're about to swallow, there's a mechanism that will close the, the trachea. So the trachea has to be closed because you have the epiglottis. So we'll also look at the mechanism of swallowing. That's how I'm going to explain in detail what happens to the epiglottis. How does it close the trachea, the vocal cords, so that the bolus doesn't go into the trachea or the fluids, uh, the, the liquids that you are drinking, they don't go into the trachea. Because once there is some food stuff, there are food residues or fluids that are moving into the trachea, they can bring about aspiration pneumonia. Then you can die from that condition because the lungs won't be working very well. So there is a mechanism that will coordinate the movement of the bolus to prevent it to go into the trachea so that the only way it can go is into the esophagus. So I'll explain all that. Okay, so you can still appreciate the accessory organs even in this diagram. We have the, the, the salivary glands. So the major salivary glands, we have the parotid salivary glands, which are paired, and also the sublingual salivary glands, which are just under the tongue, hence the name sublingual salivary glands. And then you also have the submandibular salivary glands, which are just besides the, the, mandible, the mandibular bone. So you have the mandible, so just behind the mandible or on the lateral side of the mandible, we have the saliva glands there, which are called the submandibular saliva glands. It's also a big saliva glands. So these are the three major pairs of saliva glands. And of course, we also have the buccal saliva glands just on the, on the buccal here, buccal cavity. We have the buccal saliva glands that can also produce saliva. Okay, so our example, these are examples of accessory organs. Then the lumen of the GI team. So this is just the general lumen of the GIT. is composed of layers. Remember all the four major layers, the, starting from the inside, we have the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis layer, and the cellosa. So all those layers, I think we explained this when we are discussing smooth muscle cells. And remember the external muscularis layer is composed of two layers of muscles, the secular muscles and the longitudinal muscles. Those they are involved in motility of the GIT. Then you also have the muscularis layer that is within the submucosa. So, I mean, not the submucosa, but the mucosa layer. So you also have the muscularis layer there, which is called the muscularis interna. That is responsible for the movement of the, the villi. Remember the finger-like projections. You have those microvilli and villi. So those finger-like projections that are increasing the surface area for absorption after digestion, and also to provide brush border enzymes that are involved to finish the digestion of certain macromolecules. So you have some muscles that will facilitate the movements of the villi. Okay, so those are muscularis interna that is associated with the mucosa, okay? <clears throat> Then we have the intrinsic nervous supply to the GIT. So the intrinsic nervous supply to the GIT, we have two major plexuses. We have the submucosa plexus, which is also called the Meissner's plexus. Then we have also the myenteric plexus. The myenteric plexus is also called the Auerbach plexus. So you can see here, the submucosa, which is also called the mesnas, and also the myenteric, which is called the Auerbach plexus. Then the four major layers of the JT, you can see them here. If this diagram is not clear enough for you, we have another one here. So this diagram is just showing you the layers of the JIT, which we've already discussed in anatomy or histology. So starting from inside here, we have the mucosa, like I said, the mucosa has got also some layers. So the innermost layer of the mucosa is the epithelium. The epithelium, this is a layer of cells that are covering the rumen of the GIT. 
Then after the epithelium, of course, there is the lamina propria. After the lamina propria, we have the muscularis mucosa. So the muscularis mucosa is also called the muscularis interna. So this is the one that is responsible for the motility of the microvilli. It's responsible to increase blood flow to the mucosa and to the GIT. So we'll have functions of these muscles. Then after the mucosa layer, we have the submucosa. So the submucosa is after the mucosa, hence the name submucosa. So the submucosa is where you can find the glands. So you have glands that are producing secretions that will result into introduction of enzymes and fluids into the lumen or the GIT. Some of these glands are found in the submucosa. Then the blood supply to the GIT. The blood supply, we have small, small arteries and uh, in veins that are found in the submucosa. So this is a loose connective tissue. So it's more of a connective tissue that is connecting the mucosa to that of the muscularis. So it's in between the mucosa and the muscularis layer. Then layer number three, it's called the muscularis layer. So you can see muscularis externa. So this muscularis externa now is composed of two layers of muscles, like I mentioned. We have the innermost, which are called the circular muscles, and the outermost are called the longitudinal muscles. So the circular muscles and longitudinal muscles, the difference is just the orientation of the muscles. So the circular muscles, they are more like on the circumference of the GIT lumen, then the longitudinal, the orientation is running, is running along the long axis of the GIT. So it's just the orientation, which I already mentioned when you are also discussing smooth muscle contraction or smooth muscles in general. So the muscularis layer is the one that is responsible for the GIT motility. So motility, the movement of the bolus, you know, those peristaltic mechanism that will result into the movement of the bolus, maybe from the pharynx into the esophagus, from the esophagus into the stomach, from the stomach into the small intestines, large intestines, all the way to the anus. So those motility of the GIT is mainly enhanced by the muscularis layer, which is composed of longitudinal muscles and circular muscles. Then we have the cellosa. This is just the outermost epithelium that is covering the GIT. Remember, this GIT is a tube that is running in the cavities. So in this cavity, be it the, the abdominal cavity, so you find that the outermost of this GIT is also covered in epithelium layer. So that epithelium layer is part of the cellosa and also some connective tissue. Then at the center, you have a lumen. Then when you check, when you check the, the layers of the GIT, you can also find structures like lymph nodes. So those are called mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. So they are there to fight bacteria. They are there to provide immunity. Because you know to say that there's a lot of bacteria proliferation in the GIT. So the, the ingester will stay within the GIT for a longer period of time. The minimum maybe of five, eight, eight hours, maximum of 12 hours. So because the ingester is staying within the GIT for a long period of time, there is higher chance that there will be proliferation of bacteria and other pathogens. So the GIT has got its own mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue to fight the germs, to fight the bacteria or whatever can harm the body. So all that is part of the GIT. Okay, so without wasting much time, we proceed to the esophagus. So the esophagus, like I said, is a tube now. This is a muscular tube that is connecting the throat, which is the pharynx, with the stomach. So a tube between the oral cavity and the stomach is called the esophagus. So the esophagus is a muscular tube. But remember, the trachea is non-collapsible tube because it has got those cartridge. But the esophagus, it has got just muscles, so it's a collapsible tube. So it's going to collapse when there is no bolus passing there or when there is no ingester that is passing there. But when there is ingester that is going to pass there, it needs to open up. So that's why it's a muscular tube that can allow movement of the bolus from the oral cavity all the way to the stomach. In terms of length, it's eight inches long. 
and is lined by the moist pink tissue, which is called the mucosa, then mainly the type of uh, epithelium that is found here is called stratified squamous epithelium. Stratified squamous epithelium. So it runs behind the windpipe, which is a trachea in the heart, but in front of the spine. The spine, you have the vertebral column, the vertebral column at the back here. After the vertebral column, as you are going inside, that's where you find the esophagus. So it's in front of the spine to some extent, but it's behind the heart and the trachea, the windpipe. But just before entering the stomach, it passes through the diaphragm. Diaphragm is also a muscular structure. So these are muscles, muscles that are separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So the esophagus has to pierce through the diaphragm for it to go to the, to the stomach. Otherwise, if it doesn't pass through the diaphragm, then it means that it can't reach the stomach. So it's a tube that is entering the stomach via the diaphragm. Then does got sphincters. The sphincters are just like circular muscles that can, uh, that can contract to close the lumen or they can relax to open the lumen or the GIT. So the esophagus, it has got two sphincters. We have the lower esophageal sphincter and also the upper esophageal sphincter. So the lower esophageal sphincter and the upper esophageal sphincter. So the lower esophageal sphincter is a bundle of muscles at the lower end of the esophagus where it meets the stomach. So where the esophagus is meeting the stomach, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, which is contracting in most cases. So if you're not eating anything, the lower esophageal sphincter will be contracting to close the lumen between the stomach and the esophagus. You remember that the stomach is producing a lot of hydrochloric acid. And if you have a movement of this hydrochloric acid from the stomach into the esophagus, it can bring about heart bends. So God designed it that there should be a sphincter, a strong sphincter that will prevent the movement of the stomach contents into the esophagus. But it can only open when the bolus is approaching so that it can allow the bolus to move into the stomach via the lower esophageal sphincter. So when the lower esophageal sphincter is closed, it will prevent acid and stomach contents from traveling, from traveling backwards from the stomach, like I mentioned. So anything that is found in the stomach is very difficult for it to move into the esophagus. Why is because they, we have a strong lower esophageal sphincter that will prevent that. That's very important also. Okay, so this diagram is just showing the esophagus and the movement of the bolus. So like I said, I'll explain this when we start looking at the swallowing or deglutition reflex. So you can see the esophagus is just a muscular structure which you discussed with anatomy, okay? In this diagram, you can appreciate the two sphincter muscles the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. So the upper esophageal sphincter is going to be between the esophagus and the pharynx. Then the lower esophageal sphincter is between the esophagus and the lower part of the esophagus and the stomach. So these are the two sphincters that under normal circumstances, they are closed, but when you are swallowing, they have to open. So the first one that will open is the upper esophageal sphincter then the food will be now, um, <clears throat> it will be now moving towards the stomach. As it's approaching the stomach, you have the lower esophageal sphincter that will have to relax and to allow the movement of the bolus from the esophagus into the stomach, okay? This is a structure of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is very important to know. So there are muscles that are contributing to the lower esophageal sphincter. So the diaphragm has got muscles. So the crural part of the diaphragm, so you can see in this diagram, the crural part of the diaphragm is contributing to the lower esophageal sphincter. Then you have the internal muscles. So these are internal circular muscles or the esophagus itself. Then you also have the external muscles. The external muscles, uh, these are also referred to as the sling muscles of the stomach. 
So you can see the string muscles of the stomach and also the external muscles. So these are the structures that are contributing to, to the formation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So the, esophage, the esophagus itself, we have the internal muscles, then the crural parts of the diaphragm, which are the external muscles, then the sling muscles of the stomach. All these muscles will contribute to the formation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So it's a strong sphincter because of the, the muscles that are contributing. So it's the same diagram here. We continue. And this is more of histology. So I've already mentioned to say that the, the type of the epithelium that is lining the lumen of the esophagus. Okay, so this picture is a diagram of histology for the esophagus. So I was explaining to say the type of epithelium that is covering the lumen of the esophagus is called stratified squamous epithelium. Then after this, you have the lamina propria in the muscularis mucosa, which is the uh, muscles of the mucosa, muscularis mucosa. So this is histology of the esophagus. This is just the mucosa itself. So I'm just interested in the type of epithelium that are lining the esophagus, which you've already discussed maybe in histology or anatomy. So moving to the stomach now, we are done with the esophagus. So the stomach has got more of columnar layers of epithelium. So the type of epithelium is columnar, but the stomach has got different parts. So the first part of the stomach, which is also contributing to the sphincter is called the cardia. That's why this lower esophageal sphincter is also referred to as cardiac sphincter. The cardiac sphincter is the lower esophageal sphincter. So it's called the cardia because it's near the heart. Remember, there is the heart. So that heart is closer to the lower esophageal sphincter. That's why it's also called cardiac or cardiac sphincter. And then going inside <clears throat> or the other parts of the stomach, we have the fundus, the body, the antrum, then you have the pyrolus. The pyrolus is another sphincter, which is called the pyrolic sphincter. So the pyrolic sphincter is the lower sphincter of the stomach. The upper, sph the upper sphincter of the stomach is the same lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. So these are different parts of the stomach. In these different parts, they have gastric pits that will produce certain products. So you have gastric pit cells, like the chief cells, the parietal cells, the D cells, the G cells that are producing certain products. So we'll look at that. So each and every part of the stomach, it will produce certain uh, secretions that will have a specific function that we'll discuss later on. This is just the anatomy of the stomach, okay? So the cross section of the stomach, you also appreciate layers of the muscles. So we have the four major layers of the stomach, the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the cellosa. So you need to understand to say that the muscularis here, instead of having two layers of the muscles, like the circular muscles and the longitudinal muscles, here you have an extra layer of muscle, which is called the oblique layer of muscles, the oblique muscles. So here it is. So this is just a cross section of the stomach. So when you have a cross section of the stomach, you're going to appreciate the rugi. So you can see the rugi here. The rugi, they are more like folds of the stomach. This will provide means by which the, the stomach can expand to fill in with more food or to fill in with more ingester. But the layers of the stomach are similar to the other parts of the, the GIT, but the only difference is, is when it comes to the muscularis externa, because the muscularis externa has got three layers of muscles, which you can see in this diagram here, starting with the outermost, which are the longitudinal muscles. Then we have the middle layer, which is called the circular muscles. Then we have the oblique layer of muscles. So this is different. So here you're having a brick layer of muscles because you want to have, when the stomach is contracting, it's, it will be able to crush the bolus or to crush the food. So it's also involved in mechanical digestion of food, just like the oral cavity. 
So the stomach is involved in mechanical digestion and chemical digestion of food because there are also enzymes that are involved in digestion there. So that's why we have these layers of muscles that are involved in crushing of the bolus or mixing of food or ingester for digestion to take place in the stomach. Okay, so we have the lesser curvature, greater curvature of the stomach. So we have the lesser curvature, which is small, and the greater curvature of the stomach. To these curvatures, this is where the mesentery will come and attach for innervation, for blood supply, and also for lymphatic system drainage. So we have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. Then you have the omentum that is going to attach there, the omentum. Okay. Okay. Basically, this is the same diagram as the previous one. So we proceed. The type of epithelium that are covering the stomach, you have the simple columnar epithelium as opposed to stratified squamous epithelium in the esophagus that we saw. So here you can see that these are simple columnar epithelium that is covering the stomach. Then on top of that, you can also appreciate the gastric pits. The gastric pits, these are more like glands of the stomach. Then within the gastric pits, you have different types of cells. Some of them are glandular cells that are producing a certain type of hormones, and others are just cells that are producing maybe hydrochloric acid, intrinsic factors, and also the production of pepsinogen. So all this is taking place within the gastric pits, okay, or the stomach. But the layers are the same. We have the mucosa, the submucosa, muscularis, and the cellosa. So a major part of the GIT, you have cellosa, but in certain portions, the outermost, you have adventitia, especially the esophagus in the neck, because you want this esophagus to attach to other structures. So it's going to have adventitia as opposed to cellosa. So these are the cells of the gastric pits that I was mentioning. So you can see you have the surface mucus cells that are responsible for the production of mucin, which is a mucus that will protect the stomach because you know to say the, in the stomach you have hydrochloric acid that is corrosive and it can damage the epithelium. So there are cells that are producing a lot of mucus to cover the layers of the stomach to prevent the corrosiveness of the acids so that there are no ulcers developing there. Otherwise, if you don't have this mucus, you don't have the production of bicarbonates to neutralize the acids, then the acids will start eating up the mucosa that will bring about peptic ulcers and other diseases. So you have the surface mucus cells that will produce mucin. Then you also have the mucus neck cells that are also producing acidic mucin. Then we have the parieto cells. The parieto cells are the ones that are producing hydrochloric acid and the intrinsic factor. So let alone you appreciate that the intrinsic factor is responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12. And this vitamin B12, I told you to say, is necessary for maturation of red blood cells. So if you have a patient that is lacking the production or they are not producing enough intrinsic factor, there will be less absorption of vitamin B12 then there'll be less maturation of red blood cell that will result into pernicious anemia, if you remember that. So to prevent pernicious anemia, the parietal cells are also producing intrinsic factor. That is very key when it comes to absorption of vitamin B12. Then we have the chief cells. The chief cells are the ones that are producing pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is a precursor for an enzyme, which is called pepsin. So the pepsinogen, when it has been produced and secreted, it's going to be converted into pepsin by hydrochloric acid. Then the pepsin will start the digestion of proteins in the stomach. So pepsin, it's an enzyme that is produced by the chief cells in the gastric pits of the stomach. Then it's responsible for the digestion of proteins in the stomach. Then you have the enteroendocrine cells, like the G cells, that will produce gastrin. So gastrin is more like a hormone that can have an effect on the nearby cells that is called paracellular uh, paracrine effects of gastrin onto other cells nearby, the cell that is producing gastrin. Then it can also have an effect on other organs of the body. Okay, so this is gastrin. So mainly is involved in motility. 
So we'll explain the functions of all this when we start looking at secretions. The small intestines or the intestines at large, we have the small intestines. The first part of the small intestines from the stomach, we have the duodenum. Then after the duodenum, we have the jejunum. And after the jejunum, we have the ileum. The ileum is connected to the cecum via the ileocecal valve. So it will be connected to the cecum, then you have the colon. The colon is simply the large intestine. So the large intestine, we have the ascending part. So we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon that is connected to the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is connected to anal canal that is also connected to the anus. So this is just the intestine. Okay, so the small intestines, we have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The ileum, you can see that is connected to the cecum via the ileocecal valve, which is more like a sphincter also. That will prevent movement of uh, chyme or the ingester from the ileum to the cecum. If in the cecum there's already something there. So there's that kind of regulation of emptying of ileum content into the cecum or into the large intestine. So the type of epithelium that is covering the small intestines, you can see you have more simple columnar epithelium, just like the stomach. So just like the stomach, you also have the simple columnar epithelium. Okay, so you can see here on the microvilli. So the finger-like projections, these are called villi, but on this villi, you have small, small projections, which are called microvilli. So the microvilli are blush border that will contain blush border enzymes that will be involved in finishing of digestion of certain macromolecules. So the digestion of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. The final digestion is taking place on the blush border enzymes. So these are the ones that are responsible for that. But I've told you to say that these finger-like projections, they can move. So that movement of the microvilli, not moving from one point to another point, but they have that beating kind of movement. So they beat in a certain way. So these microvilli, just like cilia, can also beat in a particular way. It's because of the muscularis mucosa that is responsible for movement of these microvilli. Okay. The large intestines, we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, then you have the rectum. And of course, after the rectum, you have the anal canal, the anus. So on the anus, we have the anal sphincter. So the anal sphincter, we have two major types of muscles. We have the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. By now you understand to say the internal anal sphincter, these are smooth muscles. So they are controlled by autonomic nervous system. You don't have control over the internal anal sphincter. By the external anal sphincter, they are innervated by somatic motor neurons. So they are under control of your conscious. So you can consciously control the contraction and relaxation of the external anal sphincter muscles, okay? So we'll explain more when we start looking at defecation reflexes, okay? Enough with the intestines. So the large intestines, they are also lined by simple columnar epithelium, which you can see there. Then you also have accessory organs to the GIT. So apart from the accessory organs that you find in the oral cavity, there are also other accessory organs that are found in the abdominal cavity. So the accessory organs that are found in the abdominal cavity, you can see them here, the liver, the liver it has got the gallbladder. So the liver is the one that is responsible for the production of bowel. Then after the production, if there is excessive amount of bowel, it will be stored within the gallbladder. That is also associated with the liver. So you can see from the right side and the left side of the liver, you have the right and left hepatic ducts of the liver that will transport bowel then they will join to form common hepatic ducts. Then from the gallbladder, you have the cystic ducts that can join the common hepatic ducts to form the, the bowel duct. So you can see the bowel duct here. So the bowel duct and also a sphincter. So at the end of the bowel duct, you have the sphincter. Then this bowel duct can also join with the pancreatic ducts. So you can see the main pancreatic duct and the sphincter. 
So the main pancreatic duct has got its own sphincter. So they will join here to form the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The hepatopancreatic ampulla will open into the duodenum via the sphincter of OD. So you can see here you have a sphincter, which is called the major duodeno papillae or the sphincter of OD. This is the one that is going to release the secretions that are coming from the liver and the secretions that are coming from the pancreas. So you have the sphincter of OD here. So the hepatopancreatic ampulla is the one that can contract or relax to allow secretions that are coming from the gallbladder or the liver or from the pancreas to be introduced into the duodenum. Okay. So they will contain content that will neutralize the acid, especially what is coming from the pancreas because you have a lot of bicarbonates and also the bowel. The bowel mainly is involved in the emulsification of fat. So neutralization of acids, because the chyme that is coming from the stomach after uh, stomach emptying or gastric emptying, it will have a lot of acids. So the hydrochloric acid has to be neutralized because the enzymes that are operating in the duodenum, they don't operate well in an acidic environment like pepsin. Pepsin needs acidic environment in the stomach that is between two and three. The pH is between two and three, which is very acidic. But the enzymes that are found in the duodenum, they don't operate at low pH. So that pH, that, that acidity that is coming from the stomach needs to be neutralized. So you have bicarbonates that are coming from the pancreas that are also coming from the gallbladder or the liver that is responsible for neutralization of the acids. Okay. So this is the pancreas and the liver. Of course, the liver is composed of lobes and there are five major lobes. We have the right lobe, left lobe, the quadrant lobe, and also the caudate lobe. So these are mainly four lobes of the liver. But I'm interested in the, the production of bowel by the liver, the storage of bowel in the gallbladder, and also the secretion, because this is what is involved in GIT function. Okay, <clears throat> so the functional unit of the liver is called the hepatic lobule. So you can see the hepatic lobules there. So the hepatic lobules contain the central vein, then we have the hepatocytes, which are the liver cells. Then you have the portal triad. The portal triad is composed of three vessels. We have the branch of the bowel duct. Then we also have the branch of the hepatic portal vein. Then we have the branch of hepatic artery. So this is called the liver lobule. And then of course, you can see the sinusoids. These are tiny, tiny blood vessels, okay? So the movement of bowel is in the opposite direction with the movement of blood. So it's the opposite direction. So I'll explain this later on again. The pancreas has got three major parts. We have the tail of the pancreas, the body of the pancreas, and the head of the pancreas. So these are the parts of the pancreas. And the pancreas has got two major functions. The digestive function, which is the production of enzymes and bicarbonates that will neutralize the acids. So it's involved in digestion. That is called the exocrine function because you have glands that will have a duct. So the transportation of secretions is by a duct into the lumen or the GIT. So it's called exocrine glands. Then they also have endocrine glands. So in the isolates of longer hands, we have the beta cells, the alpha cells, the D cells that are producing hormones. So it's also involved in endocrine. So that's got an exocrine and endocrine function. The exocrine is the one that will participate in digestion. Okay, so of course there are arsenal cells that are producing enzymes. So the arsenal cells are the ones that are producing enzymes. So you can see a lot of these arsenal cells cause they're producing enzymes and enzymes are protein in nature. So they'll have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum, which are shown in purple here. So these structures that are shown in purple are rough endoplasmic reticulum, of which you can appreciate the ribosomes on them because they are involved in the production or synthesis of proteins. And of course, they have the DNA, messenger RNA, you know the process of protein synthesis. 
So after these enzymes are produced, they'll be stored within vesicles, which are called zymogens. And the zymogen granules, they will contain precursor for enzymes, maybe inactivated enzymes. Then when there's need for them, there'll be exocytosis. Then they'll be transported by small ducts. Then into the main pancreatic duct via the sphincter of OD into the duodenum. Okay. Then the gallbladder. So you can see the parts of the gallbladder here. The gallbladder has got also three major parts the neck, the body, the fundus. So the neck, the body, and the fundus of the gallbladder. So the storage of bowel salts in the gallbladder is only taking place if the liver has produced a lot of bowel. Then the sphincter of all is closed. So it will come back and be stored within the gallbladder. So during the storage of bowel salts, there is modification. So there will be more reabsorption of water. So there will be concentration of bowel salts that will take place within the gallbladder. So there is modification of bowel salts that is taking place in the gallbladder. But when there is ingestion in the duodenum, there will be enzymes that will be released like secretin and cholecystokinin that will enhance the secretion of bowel salts. So those enzymes, I mean, uh, those uh, hormones, they are actually hormones, not enzymes. The cholecystokinin and secretin are hormones that are produced by cells of the mucosa that are responsible for relaxing the sphincter of OD and also relaxing the bowel sphincter and also the pancreatic sphincters. So they are going to relax to allow movement of these secretions into the duodenum. So we'll also look at, we'll look at the mechanism by which the secretions will be allowed to move from one point to another point. Okay, so this is basically the same information. We proceed. So this is the end of the functional anatomy of the GIT. We've looked at the accessory organs. We've looked at the GIT itself from the mouth all the way to the anus, what structures are there. We've looked at the histology of the GIT, what type of cells are found there in the esophagus. We said you have squamous stratified epithelium. Then in the stomach, you have simple columnar epithelium. In the small intestines, large intestines, you also have simple columnar epithelium. Then you also have sphincters, which are basically smooth muscle cells. And these muscle cells, they can contract to allow movement of the ingester. So when there is some sort of regulation, it could be enzymes, it could be intrinsic nervous supply that will cause relaxation of the sphincters. And once they relax, then there will be movement of secretions, maybe from accessory organs. Okay, the accessory organs, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, and also other structures associated with the GIT. Even the production of saliva is also regulated to some extent. So once we start looking at secretions of the GIT, you will see the regulation. What is involved for regulation of secretions of GIT? Okay. 